quiet seaside town, an evil lain to rest centuries ago, has risen. An abandoned fortress deep in the swamp holds a secret that could save the village or destroy it. Now, a band of adventurers sets out to dig up the wounds of the past and bring the light of day to the roots of ruin. This is Tabletop Gold. friends, and welcome to Tabletop Gold, episode 145. Yes, that's correct. I'm Lars Castine. Welcome to the show. I'm joined today, uh, as always, by Robin Lang. Hi, Robin. Hello. Good evening. Good that time. Good morning. Good whenever. David the Tin Man Chernikoff is here. Good that time. Armand Humphreys is here. Good that time. And Zoe Chernikoff is here as well. Oh, good this time. We're going to get into, uh, we're breaking off a new five today. That's very exciting. We're going to get into our game of Pathfinder 2nd Edition in two shakes of a lamb's tail. But before we do that, Zoe had a provocative and intriguing topic of conversation that I think that we should bust into right now. Zoe, would you please? I will. Um, it's Thank a you. It's a hard-hitting question. Mm. It takes a lot of self-reflection, mm. and it is as follows. If you had to pick between being a princess, a spy, or the president, let's say of the United States, but if you feel strongly that it be another country, uh, I'm open to hearing it, which would you pick? And, you know, a few, a few words about why. Is this a question that other people have asked or answered? I've never heard this before, but it's I, so I specific. I cannot claim credit. Um, it is uh, where I work when, when new people join our team, mm. we're a remote workplace, so we do a little, like, 45-minute question you know very friendly sort of softball icebreakers um which are always switched up and sometimes veer into like wildly strange but this one is the one constant that everyone always insists on asking so mm -hmm. for whatever reason it's it's the gold standard as it were which feels right here for table did it win gold. icebreaker madness at some point <laughs> Ooh, icebreaker madness. that's Ooh, a good like idea. that one i like so that. write that one down somewhere okay. someone write that down somewhere you listener write it down I, I can go first and be contrarian. Please. Great. Let's do it. <laughs> Wait, how can you be um, contrarian if you go? All right, let's just see what happens. Let's just that's see what happens. the <laughs> most contrarian possible outcome. <laughs> um, I reject the premise. Oh, oh come right. on. <laughs> Show's over. I don't know. I All three of them are awful to me. <laughs> I'm like, this, this feels like being asked oh. to do three difficult jobs, none of which I'm interested in doing. Interesting. Now, Zoe, so, in the workplace... What, Mm -hmm. it, would that be a, an answer that makes people happy or would that be an answer that? <laughs> right. Someone news joined the team and you want to let them know how fun and thoughtful you are to work with. And yeah, so you I disregard the premise. I would definitely not give that answer in a work icebreaker. <laughs> no, it sounds like you would just quit the job. <laughs> yeah, it's also funny, Robin, because I think it's designed, and this is not how I personally feel about three of all three of the options, to be three delightful things from which you are having trouble choosing because each is better than the next, right? They, like, I think that's what they're going for. They can all end with you being assassinated. True. Um, they, all re they all require either an incredible attention to constant detail. Um, I, not, not either, just they all in, in require that. Um, two of them require incredibly hard decisions. The other one requires constantly being on and up. And then the other two are, two require really difficult decisions. <laughs> okay. And then right, two we'll make a chart. We'll get a table together. Incredible having to be on constantly, like in a sure. performance mode constantly. So like sure. Venn diagram. And they, cause they're not yeah. just jobs. Those are lifestyles. Yeah. Like you choose that for, to be your life for however long you are doing it. And that sounds exhausting. So, so if you had I, to pick, which would it be? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Princess, fine. Right, Give me the go. pretty dresses. 
I, I kind of agree with Robin. All of these sound troubling and difficult and hard to do. <laughs> um, I particularly dislike spy. I would the last thing in the world I would ever want to be as a spy. I don't understand what the upside is of being a spy, just having to live a secret life and okay. lie to people. I guess you get you get cool toys. This oh, like a James Bond type spy, not like a the Americans type spy. This right. is exactly John Le Carre did not make the spy life sound got it. that okay. awesome <laughs> yeah that's what I, right, what all I was just thinking. depressed alcoholics yeah <laughs> sorry sorry this is exactly what a spy would say yeah <laughs> fair enough yeah so the idea of like just having to lie to people constantly just makes me feel extremely anxious and i don't want to do that um being the president is a lot of work and i don't want to do that so i want to be a princess baby all right, That's we got two princess girlies out there. Robin, mm -hmm. what's your Princesses? least favorite here? Let's get the full. Least favorite is president. I, I would definitely yeah. be a spy before I was the president. Yeah. Okay. All right, David, where are you at? My answer is princess as well. Wow. But it's funny. I, the way that I process this question, which makes no sense, I'm not going to try and like defend this or anything, was the actual, like, the actual life of what it would be like to be an actual spy in the actual world. The actual life of what it would be like to be an actual head of state in the actual world and the completely not actual version of what a princess mm -hmm. is. I just sure. like <laughs> completely. You went like Anne Hathaway in yes, like, The Princess Diaries. What my brain yeah. did my... was make princess into not a thing that actually exists, which I think is kind of a fairly like American <laughs> male thing to do. You know, like we don't have a yeah. royal family here. I don't. I don't not very involved in any of the royal families from other countries that are so I just was like it was basically like if you'd asked me whether I wanted to be like a I, I don't know what like a plumber or a doctor or a spooky ghost <laughs> like <laughs> I just sort of like went for the one that did, sounded like not stressful yeah. um being an actual princess I think would be would 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 definitely be very difficult and but that's just like not that's not what my brain made of the question i don't I, I think in the end that's probably the one i would choose because they would all be difficult and stressful and involve constantly lying to people about what was going on but at least that one would involve a lot of material comforts and i really enjoy those it's true sure. yeah my brain went These straight to like points. the crown and i was thinking of like princess anne and princess 100%. margaret like oh, those yeah. aren't like <laughs> they've got a lovely a lot of lovely trappings and their lives are very delightful in many ways but it's still not an easy doesn't seem like an easy stuck life, in a cage yeah. just like if you were a, if you were a, a a president or a spy and and to be clear robin i think what you made of the question is a much better thing than what I made of the question. I just was like, oh, right. That's a real thing that people have to do. And it's awful. I just hadn't crossed my mind until you but said But like so. if Princess was like Princess Ariel? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No question. Yeah. I want to be a fish lady. Let's go. Oh, hell yeah. Fish lady. All right, God, Armand, I to be Ariel so much. We got three princess girlies on this squad. Are you a princess girly as well? I mean, I kind of want to join the princess squad. Let me be honest. Do like, it. It's awesome. I think the arguments made thus far are extremely convincing. Like, this all sounds... I don't even <laughs> like think spies though. get that cool gadgets anymore. They get, like, a USB drive and, like, a cell phone, you know? Like, yeah. Right. And, and it's I can get that. A lot of burners. Like, a lot of burners. 2024 yeah. trade Always craft is burners. like a blog. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. have a WordPress account. Yeah. Um. So, so yeah, I'm going to go Team Princess, although I agree the crown also does not make uh, princessing look all that fun. I want to be like a Princess Peach. Is that cool? I want to yeah. like be in a different yes. castle and shit. I think that's You'd be dream. Peach, I'd be Daisy. We're going to go play some golf. Fuck yeah. See, and Armin, that is the princess life you? I can get behind. <laughs> what, what's, what's bottom of the rank here? Bottom of the rank? President, I think. It just like... Nothing about that seems fun <laughs> or yeah. like particularly rewarding these days. Yeah. Yeah. So Zoe, are you going to make a perfect five for five princess party? I'm sorry to say that I'm not. <laughs> That's too, um, too power hungry. I am team spy. Ah. Mm. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me at all. Coming from, like, I think it would actually be sort of the most personally rewarding thing to, like, I think I would enjoy doing that the most of the three. 
And I really don't want the paparazzi. Like, I do not want to be a publicly famous person. Mm. I don't want people following me places. I don't want my picture showing up anywhere. And I feel like the only way you avoid that in this trio is uh, is spy. Uh, president is absolutely last for me. I feel like being president is an impossible job, um, not to mention the, like, campaigning portion of it. Uh, so, I, like, Ooh. appreciate princess. It, I think this is also complicated for me. Um, David, when this first this question first came up, our kids had just started reading this series of early chapter books called The Princess in Black. Good early readers, but the princess um, is a very princessy princess with a big pink gown. But then a, a bell goes off or an alarm because monsters are coming out of a hole to eat goats. Oh. And she has to turn into the princess in black, who's like a monster fighter, Ooh. who goes and, and sends the monsters back down the hole so they don't eat goats. Um, so in my mind, maybe like being a princess a little bit is being a spy, which I don't know what that means here, but it's just what's going on in my brain. Honestly, that was the best pitch for Princess I've heard yet. And I was already <laughs> right? on board. That? Like, I get to monster yeah. fight and wear the pretty dress. I'm in. Yeah. Don't threaten yeah. me with a good time, Zoe. <laughs> you know, I think the Princess in Black may also be, like, the head of state for her kingdom. Like, I think she may be doing all three of these at once. Wow. That's true. Dang. The true what a lady. responsibility. You know what else is a lot of responsibility, guys? Thank you, Zoe, for that topic. Uh, I thought that was awesome. I loved it. I can't wait to hear what people in the Discord, uh, what their opinions are on this. (laughs) Oh, yeah, we should do a poll. We should do it. Um, But you know what else is a lot of responsibility is breaking off a five, everybody. It's 145, episode 145. We're breaking off a new one. There's a lot of responsibility there. One of those responsibilities is letting you know what's going on in our neck of the woods. We are community supported. We love doing this show, but in order for us to keep doing this and to keep doing it better we need the support of you the person listening to the show so thank you to everybody who is supporting us on patreon we have great shows coming out on our premium offering that if you're a fan of this show you will want to listen to as always we've got episodes of the gold mine some really fun uh conversations about what goes into our game behind the scenes stories gm advice listener emails all of that we also have specials that come out Throughout the month, these are spoiler-free shows that feature no information about the ongoing story of this podcast that you're listening to that are perfect for you if you haven't caught up yet. Recently, this is what has come out since the last time we talked about this stuff. We did an episode of the Tier List show where we judged a bunch of tabletop role-playing game manuals by their cover art. We had some really cool discoveries of new games that we had some of us had never heard of. Uh fun sort of throw like we talked about the dallas role-playing game for at some for some point which is seems like a, a very interesting time there's an episode of film debuff that came out since the last time we talked this was a uh, an episode where we talked about mazes and monsters which if you don't know about it is a truly loathsome movie from 1982 <laughs> about the horrors of role-playing games Terrible movie, great conversation. Tom Hanks uh, it turns into a wizard or something. It's a fun he's time. He's a holy Check man. He, he, that's oh, what yeah, he says. He's a holy man. Repeatedly. Uh, and just last week, we put out the first episode of Goldmine Rewind. We're going through classic episodes of this podcast and tackling them 10 at a time. So what came out last week is a uh, show that covers episodes 1 through 10 and gets into some of the stuff that we were dealing with right at the beginning of the run of this show. This uh, Goldmine Rewind is perfect for first-time bingers, but also great if you're returning to memory lane as you're thinking about tabletop gold gone by. Uh, We're excited about these, and we think that you will love them. Well, and Lars, how exactly would people access this content? Well, it's actually really easy. You either go to tabletopgold.com or you go to patreon.com slash tabletopgold and you support the show there. We, uh, there, there's, at this point, there's now like a lot of content on there. All you have to do is chip in five bucks to get you audio, 10 bucks to get you video. And if you want to support us more than that, we've got tiers going up from there. And again, we're community supported. So thank you to everybody who, who makes the choice to support the show. So, uh, our 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 hearts and our thoughts go. That's not how that phrase works. Did our, they all our, die? Thought, <laughs> yeah, they did. Uh, thoughts and prayers to all of you who are supporting us on Patreon. Uh, <laughs> great, good stuff. Let's get into it. Hmm. Uh, Nailed it. Perfect. No notes. Let's play our game. 
You are face to face with a contract devil, a Fistophilus, by the name of Euravian. These devils serve as clerks and bureaucrats within the complex hierarchies of hell, but are rarely seen here on Galarian. Euravian, however, was contracted here by Belcora Haravex to oversee her army and has been stranded here for hundreds of years, waiting for someone to free him from a contract he has been locked into since Belcora's death. And now you are here. Euravian has asked for your help, promising to clear the obstacles that block your path out of the way and to leave this place along with the rest of his devils. If you deliver the prize that was contractually promised him in his agreement with Belcora, allowing him to return to hell. That prize that he wants you to get is the soul of a charlatan, a criminal, and descendant of the Rose Guard, Carmen Rajani. So the last thing that happened is that Euravian revealed to you that what it is that he needs is the soul of Carmen Rajani. And he looks at you expectantly and says, so we, uh, we have a deal, right? A little quid pro quo. I'm sorry, who? Who's this again? You remember when we met the bounty hunter and she was like gonna kill a guy, but then it like didn't work out and he hit her and ran away? Right. Oh, oh, that's who she was going after? I think so. Did you hire a bounty hunter? She says looking at him. Was that, did you try that? Well, you know, over the years, a number of, let's call them underachievers have come through here. Not like you, not like me. No, obviously. Not, yeah, you know, you know how, uh, you know how it goes. We like excellence. We like excellence because we like ourselves and we trust ourselves. So yeah, some loser came through here and said that she could do a job and it turns out she can't. So. We could do the job. Norman looks around to try and get a read on everyone else and see how chaotic he's going to have to be here. How is Istin reacting to this at this point? Was any of that helpful for Istin? <laughs> Presumably <laughs> because not. Because he hasn't, he didn't meet, because he hasn't met Carmen. Like, this is right. all, he's catching up on all of this, right? Yeah, no, exactly. I think he's kind of not, uh, not clear on why we're considering offering someone's soul to a, a literal devil. It, it, I, I suppose it just seems. I, I'm surprised, you know, you all seem like, well, mostly upstanding folks, some of whom do have a admittedly somewhat grotesque interest in dental um, <laughs> procedures, voluntar involuntary uh, dental examination. More like deep commitment to my craft, Norman says, like trying to catch, catch he's still, the devil's eye. You're even or AO it. is still Norman right now, right? AO is Norman, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> that does feel right. Right? Know your audience. <laughs> I, I, I just... You know, I, seems fairly unambiguous. You know, devil. Bad human soul, Please. more ambiguous. <laughs> Admittedly, he looks over to um, Euravian and is like, I do want to know if you have any self help literature, though. I love, you know, the idea of loving yourself and so trusting yourself to believe that you can do their job. I, that, that's gold, man. Euravian snaps his fingers and manifesting out of thin air is like a huge library shelf of like 
dozens and dozens of manuals on self-improvement, on self-betterment. And he sort of spreads his arms back and he says, you're free to check out any three books from my library if you make the deal. And on inspection, Mag like looks uh, looks at this wall and she sees that many of them um, on, on like the, the shelf that's at eye level are embossed with the same symbol that reads Euravian Academy, Euravian University. Euravian, right, like I yeah. would picture him making his own self-help books and then like oh, yeah. getting some really good graphic design yeah. that he paid nothing for. <laughs> you know, oh, I'm going to pay an exposure, dude. Mm-hmm. Like, if you're going to get so many jobs out of this. If it's- you're not <laughs> using artificial uh, inspiration at <laughs> this point to do all of your work for you, you are leaving money on the table. In my mind, though, it's the same, like, two pictures of him with mirror image. Like, every cover has an image of him shirtless doing something ridiculous. And if you if you look closely, it's just the same two images, like, slightly flipped or, like, angled. So, like, he didn't bother to take new photos for each. He just keeps reusing the two that he likes. I mean, when, when it works, it works. He sees that you're looking at a cover of a book, and he, like, slaps your uh, hand on the wrist, snaps his fingers, and the books disappear. He's like, no, no, no. That's not for free. That's not for free. <laughs> It's then you don't get to see that. his head back around and it's like, right, so we're damning the soul then, right? I mean. So, well, so we all know that Carmen's kind of an ass, right? We've all figured this out. A deeply, but, a deeply corrupted man, yes, for so, sure. So tell me, though, like, I know why the four, well, the three of us don't really like Carmen that much, but why don't you, why do you want his soul? Besides from it helping break your contract with Belcora, like what about his soul? He scowls for a second and he says, well, I owe the soul of a Rajani to someone who is much more powerful than myself. He's actually a really, he's a good guy, actually. Really cool, really cool dude. (laughs) But if I return to hell without the soul of a Rajani, there's some uh, potential, uh, it would totally suck for me to to do that. This person, who wants the soul of a Rajani, says Mag haltingly. Is he a wizard? No, dude. He's like a cool devil guy who uh, can bench like 5,000 pounds. (laughs) That's incredible. That's so many pounds. Why would a devil want a Rajani soul? Listen... I know a lot of things. I'm a pretty, I wake, like I said, I wake up really early. First I work out, then I read a number of the books that I've written. (laughs) Then I move on to breakfast. It's seven eggs. Easton is Uh, taking notes with his uh, peacock. That's good, write this down. This is actually really good. Seven eggs? It's seven eggs. Because you you need the protein, right? You don't, you don't. You don't cook them? them? You don't cook them. Just raw in a cup? Chicken you eggs, dinosaur eggs. Do, do, do you eat the? Do you include the shells? Sure. Yes, you eat seven eggs. Are you writing this down? And under her breath, I've, I've Mag mutters, yet. "Uh, he doesn't even make his bed." <laughs> <laughs> don't look at my bed. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I don't know why. I, but, but yeah. So I know a lot of things. I have no idea why. I just told the guy I would get the Rajani soul and. He's not the kind of uh, not the kind of devil that you argue with. So, uh, but if I can pull this off, uh, big Have things you in the future. Owed him that soul for a while. Uh, for a while to you, but for somebody who's as focused on accomplishment and achievement as I am, it's actually not that much time at all. But yeah, I, I see your point. Yeah, as he as he sees you looking at him, he's like getting a little uncomfortable. He's like, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a while, sure, yeah. And, and like, sort of under his breath, Norman kind of like mutters back, someone here is like, I think, 
I think this might stem from from Vol. I'm I'm not sure it has to do with with Carmen. Like I think I think it's just a descendant of Volrajani. Yeah, the 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 way that the contracts like this work, I was meant to get Vol Rajani's soul. But in the absence of that, a descendant in this kind of circumstance, that'll work just fine. Just fine. <laughs> well, yeah, I Mag was thinking that the person we know if it's not Belcora that wants Full Rajani or descendant soul that it would be is maybe a flail. Uh, but Zarmavdi and the wizard who seems to have been implicated in the I take it to be that it's just like Satan or some incredibly powerful devil. Uh, yeah, it, this. I'm trying to tie it back into the story, and the only ways I can do so don't seem to be right. So, yeah. like as Robin, I'm sitting here like thinking, does this connect to Zarmavdi yeah, exactly. somehow? When you mention Zarmavdian, there's not even the faintest look of recognition on the face of Euravian. Not a name he knows, not a not an entity that he cares yeah. about. I imagine Trill kind of at this point has got has been okay with her answers. And she's kinda of looking back at the other three, saying, So so what do we think? Do we do, do we go through the effort of going to get Carmen and dragging him out here? I imagine that now that we're all we've all moved like um, t- 17 feet away from your Ravian and we're huddling like we're doing a football huddle <laughs> and the camera yeah, is take, looking up at all of our heads. Yeah, we, do, we need a moment. Yeah, 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 we, yeah. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> Troll says that, and then we all retreat and we huddle and and the camera's looking up at all of our faces. And we're like we're like whispering around to each other. Um, Except I think the one thing is Istin is still like inter- like asking these very intense questions. Like, so if we get him your soul, or we get you his soul, like, would you do a personal training session with me? All right, like, All right. you know, just yeah. critique my form. I need to know what I'm doing wrong. And the other three of us are huddling over this enormous exactly. decision. But Istin is yeah, Istin's just looking for looking for pointers. I feel like Euravian would be down for that though. I think <laughs> squeezing suddenly, his biceps. Suddenly yeah. you realize your avian is in the huddle with you and he's just like, <laughs> hey, can you get your boy under control? This is, this guy is, this guy is weirding me out. This just became the um, the camera swing that they do in the circle in that 70s show when they're all smoking weed in the basement. So like yeah. all of a sudden your avian cuts in as it's going between the three of exactly, us. Exactly, exactly. Mag's view is anything inside this building at a point when Belcora amasses the power to activate it, becomes a part of her destructive capability. If one soul could clear out so much of this menace, feel almost duty bound to furnish that soul unsavory as it might be and it's not like he's doing any good for us or for anyone above ground and and, and Mag turns to Istin this is a man we confronted for a previous crime and who perhaps a, a better man than I am told us we should spare and give him a chance even a passing chance even the barest glimpse at redemption and what he's made of his life since has been little more than more transgression on top of his prior transgressions misdeeds upon misdeeds I'm ready to find him and offer him up yeah plus all those dumb campaign slogans they were so dumb he promised people ponies Istin and then he didn't even give them ponies not a single pony. 
Not, not even a like single. pony raids once a day, you know. Not you show up during nothing. the worst crime no, of all. Like a monster. Good lord. So it sounds like uh, we might have a deal. Where? I, I will say, in most stories, you know, the bargain never quite goes as you think it does. I mean, you're not going to, like, change the deal here. You're a devil. Like, if you say it's so, that's, like, your thing. They do love a contract. I am bound by, uh, listen, I've got a bit of a reputation. If I don't make good on a deal that I make with you, how am I going to make a deal with anybody? Here's a question. What is the soul going to be used for? Like, is it standard hell, damnation, torment? Uh, you should have given people pony rides sort of thing? Oh, maybe the <laughs> ponies ride him. Yeah, that'd be a good one. Listen, I don't know. I don't ask. All I know, the pony thing is probably the kind of thing that this guy that I want to give this old to is going to do. So that's probably what it is. Do we bring him to you alive or dead? It's better if he's alive, but he can be dead too. I don't really care that much. Cool. Who who are you um, giving the soul to? What's what's this devil's name? Je Jeffrey. <laughs> Wait, I, no, we know a Jeffrey. It's a different Jeffrey. It's Joffrey? A fourth, it, no, it's Jeffrey. A, it's is a he a psychic? He third. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes of there's the a fourth Malibu. Jeffrey, and he is a devil in hell. So. <laughs> There's no, like, trick to this, right? Like, the whole deal is just, we give you Carmen, guys, dead or alive, and you leave. We're guys, not going we to be like, oh, on. no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to Absalom. <laughs> hey, yeah. Garibi, can you open... So, it takes, like, a day to get up there if we're going to our own. Do you happen to have a spell that's a portal spell that would help us get there faster? Yeah, absolutely. And he snaps his fingers, and there's a portal to Absalom standing right behind him. How about, like, 200 gold, just in case we need to buy stuff? He says that I'll need a soul for. Can I have your soul in exchange for 200 gold? I'm not so if we bring you receipts, will you reimburse us? No. Mm. Like a per diem? Okay. <laughs> and he says, just go. Just get, get through this. And he shoves you through this portal. Nope. And you suddenly Whoa. find yourselves standing in a new place. You are here. Oh, my goodness. In the city at the center of the world. Hey. Oh. The city of Absalom. <sighs> so Woo. Trill Absalom. and um, Trill and Istin have both been to Absalom. Trill's partied, in, partied hard in Absalom. Tristan grew up here. Tristan, Istin, sorry, grew up here. Um, but the other two, I don't know about Mag or Ao. Ao came through as she was running away, but I think uh, was sort of tired and strung out and didn't uh, absorb the city's, I'm sure, many cultural delights. So has been here, but not in a very uh, coherent way. Mag has never been this far from home. Has Mag ever left Otari, like beyond sort of the gauntlet or the lands nearby? No. Wow. So this would be huge for Mag. Yeah. I this is brilliant. We finally got you here. Ooh, ooh, you need a soft pretzel. Everyone loves a soft pretzel. Get the mustard. Euravian sticks his head out through the hole and he says, there's pretty amazing pretzels all over the place around here. Uh, <laughs> you mentioned earlier that you'd have to find Carmen. That's not true. I am able to keep eyes on anybody that is a subject of any of my contracts. Carmen is right down the street in that direction. That's wildly helpful. This is and a very big city. The section of the city that you're in is a city called the Docks. And I'm showing you a map of the Docks right now. The thing that you notice when, uh, as this portal closes behind you is that this is a busy, busy part of town. This is like an industrial zoned part of Absalom. There are people working, lifting things, selling things. It is busy, foot traffic, commerce. Like as you stand there, somebody's like, out of the way, and like brings a two by four beam like right by your head and you and you dodge out of the way. And, and business does not stop here in the docks uh, district. 
There's a smell of brine in the air, along with a smoky Osirian barbecue, uh, which is punctured from time to time by uh, a, like the faint smell of uh, sweet elven mead. Mm. As you stand on the streets looking down in the direction that your avian indicated, you can hear the sounds of many different accents and languages being spoken as you walk through these these busy uh, these busy business filled streets. Um, Trill nods and greets a couple gnomes and gnomish as they're walking by. They uh, speak a different dialect than you, and they're like, "Oh!" and deeply offended, and <laughs> grab their child and run off in the distance. Rude. As they're Just walking, rem- Norman sort of thoughtfully to himself, muses like, bummer to think about one lighthouse just wiping this whole thing out. This would do a lot of damage. Right? It's brilliant here. I, I also kind of visualize like Trill and Istin walking very comfortably and like dodging out of the way. Like, you know, like New Yorkers who have come home after a while and they still know how to walk down the streets while Mag is like kind of this very confused and overwhelmed by everything and like we have to grab her and pull her along with us totally yeah I think for some for somebody who's from a small town this is a very very busy part of the city the docks is kind of like the launching point for for immigrants into the city it is it's on the uh, northern end of Absalom Harbor it's also port a authority. connective neighborhood. It's sort of the Port Authority bus terminal. The it's, it's also a connecting neighborhood for many of the other neighborhoods around Absalom. It's kind of a throughway uh, for mu- uh, much of the city. So if you are not used to a busy urban area, this this is that, and this is probably shocking. Yeah, Mag is Mag is shocked. I mean, uh, uh, probably. S- such a sudden transition. I mean, Mag was sort of psyched up to go find this guy. Mag was not psyched up to go find this guy like today, like now, <laughs> like in a minute. Like, you know, like she was like, oh, okay, well, we'll head back and we'll pack up and like, uh, I'm going to need to, uh, you know, restock all of my pouches and then I'll get a night's sleep and then we'll go to this. You know, she was like really going to need him, you know, to mentally. So I, she she's on the verge of raging just from um, not because she, and she's not going to do anything about it, but just that's what happens to her when um, she's not in control of where she is I mean I imagine she's probably never been transported from point A to point B against her will before let alone into the most overwhelming environment she's ever seen so yeah your girl's on edge yeah maybe it strikes you that oh, Euravian is very eager to finish this deal <laughs> like he really wants this done it does strike yes one that way so Ma- mag mag uh, isn't grab her a pretzel we're, we're oh, losing her we're losing yeah. mag yeah, Mag is making a growling noise like Ao does when she's threatened. <laughs> and Trill starts looking for like uh, all of the all of the pubs here all have those like really kind of old timey English, um, lab- like pub signs hanging down. You know, like right. the, the um, frogs trousers or um, the, exactly the frogs trousers, the stork's hat, the bee um, and the the bonnet. fox's knickers. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if you're looking for bars, the black rainbow trout. <laughs> you're in the middle of a work area. The first bar is the one that your avian pointed at. It's at the yeah. end of this block. That's and, what she's looking for. And you you look down the street, and you 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 know you're you're walking past these wooden beamed buildings, uh, dock workers, you know, running across the street. It's it's incredibly chaotic. But the slimy this, seaweed, right? So we're what? At. The slimy seaweed, the name of the bar? The name of the bar at the end <laughs> of the street is actually, you see a sign that says the Grog Pit. Absalom as a city has been here for like thousands of years. This is a much older city than any cities that we know about on Earth. And it's possible that the Grog Pit has been here for longer than any business, business establishment that you've ever conceived of, right? Uh, sure, like the oldest pubs in in London, maybe a little bit yeah. more. Puts them to I shame. I assume its slogan is "Get groggy with us." 
Uh, yes, it is. That's yeah. uh, you notice that it says that on the sign. It says "Get groggy with us" in three languages: undercommon, yeah. infernal, and common. <laughs> but what is it getting at? Hmm. Yeah. So you, you're able to step inside, and it is a right now. It is about three o'clock in the afternoon. So that's a little bit of a lull before things really take off uh, later on in the day, you push through the, the this heavy stone door and and step inside. And, uh, and bef- before they step in, uh, in consultation with no one, Norman has a brilliant idea, or so he thinks, uh, and he turns into Doriana Menhemis. Oh my God. Okay. No. <laughs> so this is using your once a day uh, special Kitsune deal. That's Which, right. of course, we all know the name is, uh, you know. You can, also you, getting groggy with it. It's, it's weird. Just called, yeah. It's just called, it's weird. Uh, this is this is your Kitsune feet shifting faces. Once per day, you can create a an image of a specific person. So, so Doriana Menjemez, the spitting image of Doriana, walks into the grog pit. There is one difference, which is that she's missing a hand. Oh God! Why? It's dark. Okay. So Trill notices this change, though, and Trill's kind of whispers, "I just figured we'd surround him because there's four of us, and so we just get on all four sides." Doriana grins in a way that Doriana would never grin, and says, "Maybe he'll come willingly." Well, there's no rush, is there? Let's have a drink first. And and Mag grabs Istin's elbow on the way to the bar and says, "We are at work." <laughs> I mean, look, kidding, Kalian was drunk as anyone has ever been drunk when he passed the, the Starstone test. Sometimes being drunk helps. It's interesting that you mentioned Caden Kalian because you see indications that there is a religious presence of like the clergy of Caden Kalian here. Like there is a de facto temple of two Caden Kalians set up in the corner of the room, and there is like rowdy worship happening at the at the far side of the room as as you mentioned that. So there is some environmental support for what Isthen is saying. Anyone who thinks that they might know this, can you uh, something about this bar? Can you give me a society check, please? Uh, yeah, please. Yeah, Max. I, I wonder do if Isthen too knows anything we'll have a society check not gonna bother the society check with Trill's numbers but Trill knows she might have thrown up in here at some point while drunk <laughs> <laughs> it's like like her society check is the level of like that college junior yeah. who's like started like oh my god when I was a freshman so Ao and Isthin both have the sense that like they've heard of this place. This is a famous bar. This is this is a a big time bar here in Absalom. The owner Valcent Minstros is famous for a policy of never kicking anyone out of the bar for bad behavior. People who behave badly are permitted stay, become part of the fabric of the bar. As you look around the room, you see that most of the people here are dock workers. But you see one person sitting at the bar who is behaving particularly badly, and that is a large, muscular human man that you recognize as Carmen Rajani. And he is currently drunkenly hustling somebody. There's an elderly dwarven woman from uh, who looks like he's, she's from out of town sitting next to him, and he is trying to coerce her to compete with him in uh, a knife throwing competition. So there's like a, a there's a, a board at one of the walls and he's just like, you know, it, it's gotta be, he's, and he's drunk. He's like, it's easy. I've never even tried this before. All you gotta do is throw, you just throw one knife. It, it's impossible to miss it. Look how big the target is. And then that's all you gotta do. And you walk out of here a wealthy, a wealthy woman. And you get the sense looking around the room that everybody here has been watching him doing this for weeks. And they're sort of like rolling their eyes and looking towards him. And that's what you see. 
Doriana sort of, uh, Norman Doriana, as we'll call her, um, looks around and catches everyone eye, everyone's eye, and she's like, I'm thinking we see if he'll come on his own, and if we can't, I don't know, we'll carry him, we'll knock him out. I suspect he'd fit in the bag of holding. But then we got that whole timer thing, and I don't know. Uh, Trill goes and uses the stool next to him as like a booster and jumps up and sits up on the bar and kind of leans toward in front of um, Carmen. And he's and as he, she's doing that, Doriana, Doriana Norman starts quietly chanting in the background, Oh, Seth, no, Seth. Like just loud enough he might hear it if he were paying attention. I feel like we're all just trolling him. <laughs> Yes, correct. <laughs> the the dwarven woman that he is uh, talking to is you. You Trill overhears her saying like, um, just like, please leave leave me be. I'm just trying to to eat my my meal. And uh, Carmen drunkenly overhears Osef Nosef and says, "That's that's right, Osef Nosef." And he stands up and he yells, "Nosef!" And he looks Trill straight in the eyes and he says, uh, may I help you? I'm trying to work here. How you been, Carmen? Oh my God, there he is! <laughs> Doriana screams. And Carmen turns towards the woman that he's talking to and he says, see, they look like they're interested in a knife throwing competition. Do you want to make a little bit of money? <laughs> and it's clear he doesn't recognize you. He doesn't know who you are. He is How fascinating. drunk. He sees oh, you. He sees the opportunity for making a little bit of money. And he's just like, all right, if you're not going to take me up on the offer. Hey, gnome, you want to throw a knife? And somebody across the room just goes, boo, at him. And he's <laughs> like, shut up. Uh, Trill looks at the dwarven woman and just kind of like nods and mouths like, we got this. To like and encourage her to like take her plate and scooch off and get a break from this asshole. And she happily does that. She grabs the plate. The bartender uh, raises an eyebrow and points her towards uh, another spot at the bar where she can eat and she relocates. And Mag, um, realizing that Carmen will not recognize them, nudges forward to get next to him and says... You want to you want to make some coin by throwing knives? I'll make you a wager. You against me, one knife each. You win 10 gold pieces. I win. You come with me outside and we have a talk about where we go next. His eyes open wide. He's like, 10 gold pieces. And he stands up and he, he shouts out to the bar. He says, drinks on me in just about two minutes, everybody. And that guy, same guy at the corner of the room, just goes, boo, at him uh, one more time. <laughs> and he, he we looks agree. At, he looks at Mag and he says, you're on. And he hands Mag a knife. Oh my gosh, my dad would hate it if he knew this was happening, says Norman Doriana, who has not gotten the message that this guy has no idea who she is. Has Istin come over to join everyone, or is he trying to get a drink at the bar? I think he got a drink at the bar and is over with the Caden Kaleonites, like maybe touching like some of the first drops of the beer that's been poured on his forehead and like talking to them. Oh, we met this amazing fella, a Euravian. He's a devil. Have you ever met a devil? And trying to like get their read on the situation. And they're they're too busy watching what's going on with uh Carmen. Like they're like they everybody sort of knows that something is about to happen. So Carmen turns to Mag, like I said, and says, "Take a knife." Mag takes a knife. You care to Throw first or second? He says, why don't you, why don't you go first? So, um, I'm going to make a pitch that this should be an athletics check. Go ahead and make an athletics check and let's see what happens with Carmen. It's only a seven on the 
die, which is not amazing. So it's a 25 total. I want to hero point that. Okay. I want it to get a little worse. Yep, got a little worse. That worked. That's a 20. <laughs> it went worse. worse. You were right. <laughs> it is incredibly irritating. If only I had some way to assure the result. Yeah. <laughs> Can Trill, um, so usually she would use like music to support someone, right? Mm. In this case, yeah. could Trill use her music to debuff and try and distract him? Sure. Uh, Ao also, or uh, Norm Norman Doriana wants to do something to interfere when he goes, but I don't know if it's better to roll that now or. Here's what wait. I'm going to say. The two of you working together, I'm not going to ask for any checks. You'll give him a misfortune effect on the roll. So you right. tell me what it is that you do. He'll roll twice. He'll take the worst roll. As he goes, like, as soon as he starts to make that gesture to throw, Trill starts, like, playing really discordant, um, jarring chords on her lute. It's like someone in a baseball game going, like, Hey, bada, bada. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and what's Doriana doing? Uh, Doriana Norman sends her uh, mage hand to sit on top of the target with the hopes that it can reach down and flick at the, at the knife when it's thrown oh, wow. and knock it off course. Serious foul play. Okay. So he is jolted by Doriana, by Trill, and he turns and, and sees Doriana, and he rolls, and he gets a 23 on his athletics roll. Now, if they're both rolling, there is no roller that wins the tie, right? There's no roller that wins the tie. So he essentially hits Mag's knife dead on mm -hmm. and his knife clangs and falls onto the floor and he looks at mag and he's like well if i had gone first i i would have won and he looks at mag and he looks at doriana and he says wait a minute i know you i know all of you except for that guy over there by the caden <laughs> kalianites <laughs> hello <laughs> doriana man what Oh, Osef sent you! Osef sent no. all of you! No, I'm here because my dad is a tired old mayor and we knew we needed fresh blood in town. <laughs> God. <laughs> so you're saying, wait a minute, you're not saying, here to hurt me? No. Otari is ready for a revolution, baby. <laughs> and he's says, drunk. And he says, the Rajani revolution. Mm-hmm. It's alliterative. Yeah, that's how you know it's good. And he, <laughs> he stands up and he's he's like in a full-on flight of fancy at, at this point. Like he's he's hallucinating. He's so overtaken by what's going on right now. He stands up and he points at everybody in the room and he says, That's right, everybody. I'm a Rajani. Who are you? You're Nobody! It's supposed to be me who's the mayor, and we're gonna go all the way back to Otari, and we're gonna take the city back! Yeah! He does uh, the Howard no. D. Doriana oh, starts no. a, a clapping chant. Oh, Seth, no, Seth. Ch -ch 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 -ch. But that and, shout made everyone super uncomfortable instead. Yeah, yeah his candidacy is over. <laughs> yeah. And Carmen grabs the bar and just goes, Bwah! and barfs all over the bar. And he's just like, oh. Trill leaves a silver piece for the bartender. Mag, pick him up. Mag picks him up. <laughs> the bartender looks at Trill and does this, like a silver piece. She <laughs> motions her finger. She's like, that's not going to do it. Yeah, Mag had gotten. Trill just puts her hands up. That's all I got and just starts walking out the door. Mag had gotten out 10 gold, uh, 10 gold pieces uh, for the wager. And so she tosses the, the, um, little pouch of 10 gold pieces to the bartender as she lifts him. So he's, she's dragging him along, but effectively it, it looks like he's kind of standing and walking, but effectively she is holding him just at her side and uh, escorting him out into the street. Oh, Seth, no, Seth. Dorian and he's and muttering after himself. He's going, oh, Seth, no, oh, Seth. I think Isthen is still in the corner with the Kaleanites. He's be like, so, 
he didn't like Asmodeus? You're saying Asmodeus is diametrically opposed to everything that Caden Kalian stands for? They're like, I'm afraid so, my good man. Yes. Oh, well... I mean, how does he feel about, like, self-made devils, you know? Like, who are out there every day on their hustle trying to grind their way up to, to being somebody in this world. And they say, I'm you know, sorry I connect to tell with you that. this. There's actually a system of exploitation that even a self, quote-unquote, self-made devil relies upon in order to get where they are. Oh, and that, that... In order for... I'm sorry, there is a system involved. It's actually quite obvious that there's a system involved, uh, sir. So Trill's thought is to get back to where the original portal was. Like, Because how are we getting back to um, Euravian? Well, I'll tell you. Yeah, I think he's just going to be keeping an eye on the situation and uh, whisking us back. What happens is the four of you start walking out the front door, Doriana mocking Carmen the entire way. And there's a step that you're taking that you think is going to put you up onto a sidewalk. And instead of putting you on a sidewalk, it actually winds up transporting you all the way back to Euravian's office. Oh, that was that was quick. Very efficient. That's right. It's incredible work that you've uh, done. Look, campaign headquarters, says Doriana, trying to uh, keep Carmen out of the loop as long as possible so that he doesn't try to run away or whatever. I, I, I just think Isthin is looking lost in thought and like his brow is a little bit more furrowed. Like talking with the Kalianites sort of has sobered him, <laughs> ironically, um, about the magnitude of what they're about to do and, like, the connecting with his, you know, religious beliefs um, about being chill and a good bro. I don't know. I think it's it's thrown him into some conflict. I would have expected this more from Vadim. Kidding Kalian's also a pretty chill dude. <laughs> But, like, Carmen's not a chill dude. Right, but I don't know. Did it look like he had that great a life? Hustling small people for... Yeah, cheating people out of money, because he's just made, like, every time he's been offered a chance to make a good decision, he's chosen the path of trying to screw someone over. Right, right. But does it fall to you and me to make that decision, you know? I, I mean, I've half a drink in. He's still got his tankard, by the way. Like, <laughs> I don't know what's right and what's wrong. I mean, I know I like, I'd really like to get the definition that your avian has. You know, he's, his abs have abs, you know? I Here's what I'll say. I don't know what's right or what's wrong either. I think in the past few weeks I've really started leaning to not really knowing what's right or what's wrong but here's what I do know we don't want devils to come and take over Otari and have Belcora amass an army that could destroy Absalom Mag wheels on Isthen and says this is not a moral choice it's a practical one and she leads Carmen up to Euravian and hands him over. And Euravian says, fantastic. And he flicks his hand towards his desk. Everything on his desk goes, do, 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 like collapses like a set of strange, like telescoping interlocking geometric shapes. Like, tuk, 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 and his desk collapses into a tiny cube. And then everything <laughs> else around the room packs itself into, into smaller and smaller boxes. These braziers, everything on the wall, tuk, 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 until it's just this small centimeter by centimeter cube. This was some animated S movie, wasn't it? I feel like this happened somewhere. Sit, and excellent. it sits on the floor. Euravian says, Corlock, why don't you grab that? 
and the Barbazi walks over, picks up this cube that represents every single belonging that the devils had here. And then Euravian says, and you, the other one, grabbed a guy. The other Barbazu grabs Carmen, and Euravian says, it was a pleasure doing business with you. And then pff, they're gone. They're gone, and there's a plume of smoke. And as the smoke dissipates, you see three copies of the same book. <laughs> he fucked you on the deal. He gotcha. <sighs> You wanted three books. You got one book three times. Three times. <laughs> this is exactly what I'm talking about, you know? Trill looks at the smoke all around and is thinking about what Isin just said and just and just says it like, what, what have we just done with our souls? Doriana Norman shrugs unbothered by this and goes, he promised people ponies. <laughs> I really... I really thought better of you, Mag. And you too. Ew. I gotta go home. He finishes a drink, puts it down where the cube that contained all of uh, Euravian's office supplies is... <laughs> and like scratches at the back of his head. Turns around and says, I guess I'll see you tomorrow. And walks towards the stairway up. Um, Lars, what time of day is it? It's currently about 3.30 in the afternoon. Um, it, it's, the, it's the, wait, wait. Listen, I... I know this is, this is probably got to be a lot. Like, you've only just joined us recently, and you haven't been through all the same kind of ridiculous experiences we've been through, and no, just know true. this is all coming... Don't judge us too harshly. This is all coming from a lot of time spent worrying about the fate of Otari and seeing what happens when... Sometimes we're too gracious. It's, you're absolutely right. It's not an easy decision. And I worry about our own souls, but, but everyone makes, has to make a decision sometimes. And those decisions aren't easy. It's like having to choose between being the president, a spy and a princess. So. <laughs> right. You pick princess every time. You know? But it's still a hard job. It's an easy job. question. It's still a hard job. It's true. You have a lot of social responsibilities to the state. Uh, <laughs> no, I... But after he's done music on that, I think he... Is, right. And, you know, I, I know from my own experience, sometimes the move you make The move you think is the right one. Um, it it doesn't work out like how you think it. Anyway, I, I just come get me when you're going to in in the morning. I'll. I'll... Hey, wait! Before you go off, wait. Have we figured out how to get where the stairs are to the next level? Oh, well, that was part of the contract, wasn't it? He'd have his devils remove all the blockage going down. Do we notice anything, Lars, as he left? Yeah, as you walk through the, uh, the hallways, you notice that the red infernal script that covers the walls has started to fade slightly. The main thing that you see when you enter that middle section that it is dead quiet and that this red wall of energy here on the northern side of the of the the room to the north this red energy has started to fade there was a wall of energy that was blocking your entrance into a rickety 
ancient elevator. Oh. And that elevator, elevator is now accessible. It seems as though Euravian left faster than he could <laughs> remove the rubble. So. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's the thing. Do you want to investigate just a little bit more before we go back? I need to go and get so drunk I don't remember anything. I'll see you tomorrow. Well, y you want some company, Esten? If you want to come, sure. But She'll jump to his be... back. <laughs> Gives her a piggyback. <laughs> yeah, it's a night tonight. <laughs> Speaking of contracts, I thought we were going to bash the shit out of that drider in the other room. Dorian and Norman calls it. after them. <laughs> As the sounds of Istin and Trill's voice disappear up the stairs uh, above you, it sounds as though Trill has somehow managed to leaven Istin's spirits, even if just for this moment. Ao and Mag are left behind. What are Ao and Mag going to do? Sorry, Doriana and Mag. <laughs> We call her Doriana Norman. Doriana um, Norman. Nor Miana. Dori Norma. Normi Nana. Normiana. Normiana. Yeah. Normiana. Yep. Normiana. Yep. Nailed it. it. <laughs> um, so, sort of realizing that she has been in this uh, bizarre Doriana form, which may or may not have manifested in any of the ways she thought it would uh, when interacting with Rajani, uh, Ao turns back into um, Ao. Looks at Mag and she's like, what? I mean, we. Everyone said they'd bash that that rider. We're we're not going to be promising people ponies and not giving them, right? You want to bash the rider? Yeah, it's an abomination of the process. Why wouldn't we make sure it can't ever hurt anyone? Is there also a pony to bash? No, the pony thing is why this is okay. You don't just go promising a town full of people a pony. I see. I see. And um, Mag takes a. A long, slow breath, and then a, a deep swig of water from her canteen at her belt, and says, Sorry, it's just been a pretty long few minutes. <laughs> lead, lead on. Ao swaggers off down the hallway towards the... Uh... I guess it's to the south where we get into the room where the various creatures are in, in the vaults of abomination, as it were. So you you walk into the the room with all of the different sustained, magically sustained, like uh, stasis trapped creatures. And you work your way forward and then to the right to get to a stasis chamber containing a drider. This is the one flesh-warped creature in this room that jumps out at, at Ao. And you, it seemed like Ao had like a strong reason for wanting to release this creature from the after effects of the process. As you look at this strange glowing blue cube, you hear like a coming out of it and you see the face of this of this drider this uh, flesh warped drow spider thing and it's locked in a look of of panic and helplessness and if you'd like to you can attempt to bash this cell open uh, Ao's gonna like quickly sort of check for traps. Like, I, what more can she learn to make sure they say as, as sort of safe as possible with this irresponsible and unnecessary decision that she's making? Yeah, give me some kind of blind knowledge check of whatever kind of magical whatever you like. Does it feel to... like astrology? It feels like astrology to me. I think it feels like astrology. <laughs> Let's do it. It's like an astrology. Um, no, she'll do medicine. How about that? Sort of like okay. what's sustaining this thing? Sure. So Ao gets a pretty good sense that there's no kind of trap around here. These cells were meant to be kept until a time when Belcora's uh, invasion was ready to move forward. These creatures are going to stay there until that time. All it takes, there, there's some 
strange ritual that one could do to safely release these creatures, but it is far beyond your wildest understanding of, of magic. So the best idea you're able to come up with is really just to hammer at this thing until it breaks. And they're on some kind of like life support where that she believes that will make it an X rider. There, you think there's a very good chance it will be an X rider. So, um, is that what you want to do? Yeah. Okay. So Ao and Mag bash at this energy field, grunting. Give me the warhammer, Mag. <laughs> um, <laughs> Mag is gonna hang on to the Earthbreaker. She will part with the warhammer. <laughs> Which I don't think I'm trained in. I have so a this couple of going I well. have a couple of light throwing hammers. Maybe Mag gives two of those to Ao so she can she can go at it with both hands. Kind of uh, those two have got smaller. like like playing a um, you know a war drum or something. Steel drums. So the first slam from Ao onto this energy wall <laughs> reverberates off, but you feel like you're making a little bit of like you feel like there's something inside of it. And what is Ao's like emotional state as she just hammers this this thing over and over again? Um, I think it goes from sort of like this this like adrenaline high of what happened with Euravian and uh, convincing Connor uh, Johnny to go into this like memory of a thing that she's sort of just doing to be obstinate. Um, into like complete and total focus. Like she just okay. gets m- more and more tuned in to what she's doing. So after a few minutes, she's she's fo- she, she finds a rhythm. She's just hitting this thing, hitting this thing, hitting this thing. It starts to collapse and I need a flat check. Uh, give me a roll a d20, please. That's a 10. Okay, that's a success. <sighs> This cell breaks apart and a flux of energy blasts across the entire room, sort of pushing your hair back as this cell, finally, the magic of it, finally dissipates. And That's a good question. Yes. Does the light feel similar to the light from the lighthouse when Ao has touched it? It feels maybe slightly similar, but also sort of like a weird perversion of it. Okay. Because it's like this, that that light from the lighthouse is like death energy. It's just pure, pure void death energy. This, this energy from this cell is like life and death in balance. Hmm. This thing is being kept dead and being kept alive as it's being held in perfect stasis. Schrodinger's Strider. <laughs> and the last blast of energy passes through you and you see that the drider collapses down on the floor dead perhaps one of its eyes catching Ao's maybe Ao feels for a moment that she perceives a small glimpse of gratitude from the drider as it falls to the floor. Would would Mag have the sense here that doing the same thing, destroying each of these um, stasis cubes would have the same effect on what's contained inside? Like, is, the, is, is this particular to the drider because of its condition inside? Or is this something where each bash eliminates one of these, as you've put it, abominations from this, as you've put it, vault? From the conversation you had with Jack, you get the sense that there is a not insignificant chance that the creatures inside could survive and then attack. Yeah. Okay. So, with this last bit of business on the seventh floor done, are you leaving the dungeon? Yeah. yeah. Ma- when, when Mag looks up, Ao has one tear sort of unusually coursing down her cheek, and she goes, I think he was. He was finally free to be himself there in the end. And she turns and walks back out. And as Ao and Mag walk up the stairs of the dungeon, 
And as Trill and Istin maybe at this point are settling in for a drink at Crow's Casks, you consider what it is that you accomplished today. You used Isand Kalir's wand. Wand. Cheapers, creepers, guys. <laughs> you used Isand Kalir's wand, wand of locate. It doesn't probably work. <laughs> to track down the fourth section of the key to Euravian's door. You vanquished the devil lurking in the depths of a pond in a quiet, natural cavern. You formed a new franchise for the bakery run by your kobold friends. <laughs> you looked into a clay bowl and found the eyes of Belcora Haravex staring back at you. You repaired the relationship between a pair of sister devils. You created a geyser in the process of depowering a gate to hell. You unlocked the door separating you from the contract devil Euravian. You made a deal with Euravian to leave the material plane in exchange for the soul of a descendant of the Rose Guard. And you mercifully ended the sad existence of a victim of flesh warping. And with that, I would like to say that everybody levels up to level Woo! eight. Woohoo! Oh. And we will pick up from there next time. Oh, it's been so long since we've had a level up conversation. Yeah, good Excited. eight time. Good eight time. Good eight time. Good eight time. of Ruin is a tabletop gold production produced under the Paizo Incorporated Community Use Policy using trademarks and copyrights owned by Paizo that are covered under that policy. Paizo does not recognize, endorse, or sponsor this project in any way, and we are expressly prohibited from charging you to use or access this content. For more information about Paizo Inc. and Paizo products, visit paizo.com. All original characters and content in The Roots of Ruin are the property of tabletop gold, and all rights are reserved. We at Tabletop Gold would love to hear from you. On our website, tabletopgold.com, you can learn more about us and our shows, pick up great merch, and connect to the best online community in all of podcasting. Thanks for listening. <laughs>